Cynthia Diaz and I'm part of EMDRCM Batch 2021 and I am currently an event organizer. I have my own events agency that I run with my partners called Outbase Events. The greatest crisis that we've ever experienced was actually the COVID-19 pandemic. We were actually the very first ones that got cancelled. So as early as February 2020, um, events already were cancelled. We were not prepared, trying to find ways on how we can actually move forward, or how we can do events safely, um, given that the situation is that we cannot do mass gathering. What I appreciate about EMDRCM, it teaches you how to be resilient, transform your business into a resilient organization, good for leaders to be equipped on how to handle disasters or handle crisis and be able to find ways on how they can move forward or how they can build back better. You get a lot of different professors from different backgrounds, from the business school, the disaster risk, the military. So it's a very diverse background and learn from case studies used from um, Harvard Business School, from Stanford to um, enrich yourself with that knowledge and not only enrich yourself, but also learn how you can apply that to your own organization or to your own business. With AIM, you become a well-rounded leader. Hey, so good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this afternoon's uh, program overview session. So let me just share my screen. Okay, so welcome again, everyone, uh, to this afternoon's program overview session on futures thinking. And together with us uh, this afternoon is Professor Jose de Colongon, a Jack faculty at Asian Institute of Management. So just to give uh, everyone a brief idea on this afternoon's uh, highlighted program, which is Futures Thinking. So let me give you this. A first in the country, the School of Executive Education and Lifelong Learning offers this Futures Thinking online program, which intends to equip Filipino leaders with the futurist mindset and a set of tools that can be used to enhance environmental scanning and strategic thinking efforts, organizational development, and innovation initiatives. 
initially used by the thinking uh, by the Rand Corporation, a US nonprofit global policy think tank during the Second World War. Futures thinking has evolved into a multidisciplinary approach that strikes the balance between well-informed short-term and long-term goals and has since then been used by corporations, governments, nonprofits, and all other types of organizations all over the world. So just to uh, quickly introduce to you uh, the program this afternoon. So initially we'll have to introduce the SEAL and a few reminders. Introduction to our upcoming online program, webinar proper, and lastly, the question and answer. So what is the School of Executive Education and Lifelong Learning? It is the executive development arm of the Asian Institute of Management. It provides world-class programs that respond to the needs of both private and public sectors. SEAL offers open enrollment programs, development executive programs, and custom programs where participants learn from AIM professors, along with a network of industry leaders and practitioners. So to discuss further, our open enrollment programs are designed for both individuals and management teams and cater to the needs of a diverse audience. Our short courses are offered on a regular basis and provide a venue for high impact learning with concentrations in business and development. Development executive programs, on the other hand, focus on relevant topics dedicated to the highly specialized needs of development uh, professionals, such as NGOs and the military. These programs are designed to allow immediate implementation of learnings to address real life critical challenges confronting the, particip the participants and their respective organizations. Our custom programs are leading edge experiential, differentiated, and results-oriented programs that are tailored fit to meet the needs of each organization in terms of developing their leader skills, competencies, which are critical for their organization's business growth and success. The SEAL custom program team works closely with company executives to develop customized training programs and initiatives geared toward helping them strategize their own objectives and action plans. The SEAL postgraduate stackable certificate courses paves way for professionals to achieve their goals and attain desired life career outcomes. The SEAL postgraduate uh, certificate courses program utilizes the latest academic innovations to enable professionals to develop their proficiency in various areas of concentration. It utilizes the design thinking methodology that postulates solution-based approaches in resolving difficulties of people around postgraduate executive development and lifelong learning. As mentioned, the various areas of concentration and discipline are from marketing management, data science and IT, general management, until innovation and management and entrepreneurship. Credentials can be earned over time, stacked towards earning a postgraduate diploma in management and building individual's qualification to lead uh, more career opportunities, advancement, and potentially high paying jobs. So for more details about our latest programs, visit our website at go.aim.edu slash seal, or email us at seal at aim.edu. So just a few reminders for this uh, program overview session. Feel free to share your thoughts and insights in the chat box. Participation in polls is highly encouraged. For your questions, upload them by the Q&A tab, and you may upload a similar question to yours to avoid duplicates. And please answer the post-webinar survey at the end of the session. OK, to give you a more idea about the enrollment procedures or the details in enrolling to this Features Thinking program, so the program schedule will be from September 3 until September 7, Wednesdays and Fridays from 1.30 p.m. to 5 p.m. on all of those dates. The program or the classes will be delivered online via live virtual interactive Zoom sessions and is currently uh, priced at 25,000 pesos or 500 US dollars. 
So it already includes learning materials, licenses for Zoom platform, certificate of completion, and more. So for attending this afternoon's uh, info session, you will be eligible for a 10% discount available until August 27, 5 p.m. Our payment options uh, can be made through credit card, bank transfer, PayMaya GCash, or check payment over the counter. And also for everyone's idea, we offer installment um, scheme for those to, e uh, to ease uh, their settling their payment fees. So you may scan the QR code uh, as flash in the screen, or you may submit a fully accomplished enrollment form at go.aim slash uh, seal enrollment. Futures thinking falls under our various postgraduate uh, certificate programs. So it will it falls under the innovation and management, entrepreneurship, and leadership and management. So coming from uh, these postgraduate certificates, uh, you'll be able to get the certificate after acquiring five units uh, under these uh, various areas of concentration. And later on, you could further laddarize it to attain a postgraduate diploma in management, which requires you to gain 20 units in the span of three years. So if you have uh, questions about the enroll enrollment procedures, uh, payment schemes, you may contact me through my um, details as flash in the screen. You may message me or email me. Okay, so uh, futures thinking program. So this afternoon we will be joined by Professor Jose de Colon. Uh, Professor Jose is a junk faculty at Asian Institute of Management. Currently, he is a COO and head of corporate foresight of Ambigan Consulting, an innovation strategy consulting firm based in San Francisco and Manila. So Prof uh, Professor Di Colomon has, has been a business director in SGS Philippines, an operations director in SGS Gulf Limited, uh, R ROHQ, and strategic Tran transformation manager for East Asia and a continuous improvement project manager based in Switzerland, Australia, and Hong Kong. He is an Australia Award Scholar and completed his master's degree in supply chain innovation from Swissburn University of Technology in Melbourne, Australia. He is a certified Lean Six Sigma Black Belt by PwC Europe and Lean Leader by GE Europe. So without further ado, uh, let's all welcome Prof. Hassan Nicolaou. Prof. Uh, thanks a lot, Seth, and uh, good evening, everyone. And it's an honor and a pleasure to be able to present to you uh, what I, you know, give you a teaser and give you an overview of futures thinking. So if you allow me to share my screen, I can switch to my slides. So it's going to be hopefully an informative evening uh, for everyone. So, um, and I'd like to start with this question, and you can write your answers on the chat. Uh, that would be great. I'm going to show you three examples of companies uh, or organizations, and I want you to, to write on the chat, what do you think are the common, uh, what do these three companies have in common? Okay, so what do these three organizations have in common? So I want you to write down your answers on chat. So the first organization, our company is Tesla. So many of you probably know this uh, company. Uh, it has grown uh, significantly, um, even though it's not the first uh, vehicle uh, to go into uh, a, a new design in terms of a more re renewable source of uh, energy. Uh, as a source of energy, it is, I think, one of the more successful ones in terms of marketing and really promoting itself um, in, in that uh, particular product segment. So that's one, Tesla. Uh, the second organization is Disney. And you can see here, it's more than just the Disney cartoons or the Disney theme parks. We're talking about the whole Disney group of companies, which include 21st Century Fox, to uh, Marvel, to ESPN, to National Geographic, even the cruise, cruise um, 
uh, lines and uh, Lucasfilm and so on. Okay, so that's the second company or organization. The third one is Mondelez. So Mondelez is one of the biggest uh, food manufacturers in the world. And it recently, well, not recently, uh, I think the past couple of years, it uh, created uh, this unit within its organization called Snack Futures, uh, which positions the company as the leader in snack food uh, and the leader of the future in the future of snacks. So it's a combination of an innovation lab, uh, really, uh, and also a venture builder, where they invest in small companies, startups, um, looking at with, with the intention of investing in the future of snacks. So these are the three organizations. So please write what do you think are the common elements amongst these three uh, companies. Okay, so write them down on the chat and tell me what you think. All right, so I'll give you a few moments to do that. If you're ready, you can already put it in. So great, I, I see already some answers. Uh, so uh, let me see. So Gwen is saying innovative and industry leaders. Yes, that's right. Edwin is saying future oriented. Cheryl, focus on innovation. Uh, Justin, all three companies have evolved into something more than what they started. Yes, that's true. Uh, yes, they are global companies. Josh Rell, they have investments in innovation. Alex is saying vision, strong leaders, innovation. Great. Uh, Joanne, innovative, innovative and forward looking. Uh, Josephus uh, is saying they're all using the latest trends, innovations and products available. And I might even hazard to say that they have started some of the trends. All right. Uh, obviously, this is a futures thinking course. So the answer is all three of these organizations use futures thinking. Actually, there are just a few examples. There are many organizations all over the world who have used futures thinking really. One, in terms of driving performance, uh, being very strategic about where they're going to invest and where they're going to take their company. Two, is they use futures thinking as a way to identify uh, the needs of their customers in the future and also develop future products and services or I would say more future adapted uh, products and services. And third is uh, they use futures thinking to set a vision for their organization. As you said, no? uh, to, to be able to deliver uh, products or services uh, that are totally new in the market and and can even change and transform the market. And what is futures thinking? Uh, for those of you who are hearing this for the first time, futures thinking is a way of thinking about new, emergent, and unknown possibilities. Simply put, it's a way of thinking about the future in a systematic way. We all think about the future, right? I mean, there is that part of our brain, physiologically, biologically speaking, that is responsible for thinking about the future. Uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, that same part of the brain is also used to think about the past. So you get to see some challenges there. If you think of the future as just a continuation of the past, you become blind to potential disruptions, to let's say long-term changes, or I would say uh, invisible changes that you get to see the trends, but normally when we see the trends, it's kind of too late. So this is really a competency that's needed by all lead leaders and innovators today to not only survive, but thrive in a volatile, uncertain, uh, complex, and ambiguous world. So, so yeah, so Katrina is saying here, all three know how to play the long game. I would agree with that. Like if we take the example of Tesla, going back to Tesla, the reason why they invested in an electric vehicle is because they saw that investing in vehicles that are based on uh, combustion engines, it's a used up future, meaning there's no future in that. Number one, oil is being depleted. Number two, the costs related to using fossil fuel. And number three, the market readiness and acceptance to actually go towards more uh, to vehicles and other you know, types of assets that use renewable sources of energy, okay? So 
what's the difference of futures thinking and strategic foresight? You know, I normally interchange them, which is fine, all right? But just to differentiate between the two, futures thinking is, as mentioned, a way of thinking about the future in a systematic way. It's about thinking, it's thinking about new emergent and unknown possibilities. While foresight or strategic foresight is the application of futures thinking and research in useful ways. So it's applying futures thinking. And for some corporate foresight, like what I do at MBGIN Consulting, is we really, we apply foresight in organizations which are more profit oriented okay so what's the difference of foresight with strategy and planning so there are really big differences here although they they are interdependent strategic thinking is different from strategic planning obviously although you do need strategic thinking in order to come up with really good strategies if you don't do it if you're not strategic about how you see the future and how you they see things will unfold, you come up with very short-sighted short strategies, right? So futures thinking actually helps your strategic thinking, helps you to explore. It's more intuitive, it synthesizes, it's creative, it's inductive, it's disruptive. It's both, for me, it's both an art and a science, okay? And this is what we teach in the course. We, we give you specific tools and frameworks that you could use to really come up with not just one idea of the future, but multiple ideas of the future. And I'll talk more about that later. And this feeds now into your strategy development process. Normally, when we do our strategic planning, right, we do it, what, every year? And normally, we look at, you know, what's, what are the trends in our industry? And I might say that there's nothing wrong with that. It's important that we know what these trends are to see whether they're going to even increase in momentum or they might just die out too. And being able to identify when will, up to when will these trends go on. But for me, trends are too late. What we want as futurists and leaders who are good in futures thinking is to be able to see the trends even before they emerge. So in the course, we actually teach you how to be able to do this so that when you develop your strategies, which is in the next three, the next five years, you're more, I would say, you're, you're way above the curve. You're, you're way ahead of your competitors in case they're not doing this yet because you're already seeing things and you're able to connect the dots even before they do. And we teach that in the course. And obviously, if you're able to develop your strategies, then you're able to now look, you're able to come up with specific plans and really look at implementing these strategies. So as you can see here, they're all different from each other, all right? Uh, futures thinking really goes onto the highlighted part, into strategic thinking. And some, for some, this is a criticism of futures thinking. Obviously, futures thinking cannot, you know, it's not the only tool that's out there for managers. Um, it, for me, I would say it's just one of the tools, but it is an important tool, right? Uh, it, because it tells you what can potentially happen. And because of that, you're able to have a better informed view of what you can do, right? Whether in terms of whether you're going to invest in a certain uh, area, a certain field, or certain technology, and you get to see, you know, will this technology just become obsolete after two years? So there's no point in investing in that. Um, but going back to the criticism, even though sometimes, right, you know what you need to do, but then you don't do anything, right? Not you per se, but maybe some organization. So what's a classic example? Classic example is Kodak. Do you know that a lot of the, the technology that's being used by digital cameras today are actually, the patents of this are actually owned by Kodak. And that for me is a very telling statement. Why? Because Kodak actually saw the shift from analog cameras to digital imaging way above, way before anyone else. But the question there is, did they do anything about it? So it's a classic example. There are many reasons why you can read it uh, you know, as a case. It's very interesting. Uh, but really, that's also an example of you might have be very good in you know, thinking about the future and seeing what, what's emerging. Uh, but if you don't do anything about it, then, then you know, 
that that's where the challenge is and can, can go the other way around too where you are very good in execution but if you don't know what's going to happen then you're just basically uh fumbling in the dark so we want to have both and i think this is something that we want to be able to build uh in organizations and in you as a manager and as a leader and there's a lot of literature that's out there. Future thinking is not a new field. Well, in the Philippines, it's relatively new. So it's actually good for organizations who are able to adopt this. They're able to have that competitive advantage over you know, other industry players. Okay. Uh, but let's say in the US, they've used this since after the war. Uh, Silicon Valley, this has been in Silicon Valley since the 1980s. Singapore, for example, uses this. They actually have a policy center uh, really dedicated towards future thinking. The thing is they don't publish anything to the public. <laughs> they don't tell anyone about what they do and what the reports are, what their research is. But it's there. It's there. And uh, there's this really good uh, futurist. Her name is Amy Webb. Uh, she has a lot of publications that's published in Harvard Business Review. And she talks about how you need to use thinking to look at different stages uh, as you move, you know, as you look, look forward, you know, you can use futures thinking in terms of tactics. You can use futures thinking to develop your strategy. You can use futures thinking for setting your vision. You can even use futures thinking to look at potential systems level evolution. Okay. Uh, normally, if we talk about corporate foresight, we probably go all the way up to vision or strategy and vision most of the time. If you talk about systems level evolution, here we're more talking about civilizational foresight. And there are people who really specialize in this. But obviously, the farther you go into the future, the more uncertain it is. The, the future has no data, basically. And, and unlike the past, which has history, our historical experience, our memories, and the present, which has observable phenomena, data that we can capture uh, for today, right? We have all of that, but the future, we don't really know for sure what will happen. Yes, it has no data. There's a really higher level of uncertainty. As you further push into the future, the higher that uncertainty goes. And in the past, it was sort of okay because more or less, the future was just a continuation of the present. Yeah, which is a continuation of the past. But more and more, what we've learned, let's say, last year uh, was that not just because it happened in the past, it's going to continue moving forward. There's this huge disruption, and it's continued to disrupt our markets, our lives, our families, uh, which is called the COVID-19 pandemic. And many people would say they were caught by surprise by this. But futurists and people who are actually more aware of, you know, coming from the experiences of SARS and MERS, scientists and doctors were actually saying, you just wait for another version, another strain of this virus that's going to really cause a global pandemic. And as early as 2004, that was already uh, mentioned in medical journals. So it wasn't really a surprise, right? But for those people who are actually aware and who had their who are able to see signals were actually able to plan for this or have considered as part of their long-term planning okay so why is it called futures plural and not future singular because when we talk about futures thinking it teaches us to more to think more than just the projected future normally if we ask you, right, if I ask you to, you know, to look at the future, you'd probably tell me, you tell me about the projected future. Okay? If I had asked you in uh, December 2019, how is going to be, how is your 2020 going to be, right? You'd have probably told me, oh, 2020 is going to be an excellent year, I'm going to travel a lot. These are all of the things that we're going to do. Um, and then March 2020 happened and everything changed. Yeah. All, everything, everything was disrupted, right? And that's where the different types of futures come in, where we teach you, I will teach you how to think about these different futures. Think about the preposterous future. If I had told you in December 2019 that, hey, you can't leave your house, otherwise you're going to die or you're going to get sick, really sick. Uh, you're going to be, you know, a major user of Gcash and PayMind, all of this digital money. 
you are going to your go, your favorite place is going to be Lazada and Shopee and you're going to do all of your shopping most of your shopping online okay you won't be able to see your friends you're going to cancel all of your vacations and so on and you'd have probably told me that's preposterous that's impossible so one of the things that we teach you in the course is for you to be able to be more open to these preposterous and seemingly impossible futures the other thing that we teach you is to look at the possible the plausible, the probable, and more importantly, the preferable. I'd like to say that there are two types of futures. You have the future of fate and the future of desire. So the future of fate, there are some things which are outside of our control. So many of us can argue that what happened here in the pandemic, that's the future of fate, right? That's outside of our control. And all we need to do is to be able to minimize there is to come up with ways that if in case something happens which is adverse we're able to minimize its impact to us or if it's a great thing then we're prepared to actually ride that wave okay but then there's also the future of desire which i would say the preferable future and the whole reason why we want to study the preposterous the possible the plausible the projected and the probable is that we want to be able to know the kind of future that we want Right? And design uh, and bringing it back to the present to be able to see the kind of future and work towards our preferred futures. Uh, another way of looking at it, and this is one of my favorite characters in Marvel, is Doctor Strange. Right? So if you remember the, the movie on uh, Infinity War, and he looked at what would be the possible outcomes of that war. And Iron Man asked, you know, which one do we win? And he said, just one, right? Uh, so in futures thinking, we don't really, I won't ask you to do 14,605,000. Um, I mean, the future is emerging. Probably by the time you've done that, there's a new set of futures. But we come up with three to four futures and we teach you how to be able to do that. And the point here is not to be accurate. Okay, uh, it's very difficult to say that. We don't have a crystal ball. Again, futures thinking is not prediction. Okay? We will not teach you to be able to, you know, see into the future using a crystal ball or magic cards or whatever. Not at all. Okay, no magic there. But we will teach you to think of the future in a systematic way so that we overcome our bias. We are able to expand our perspectives and consider other uh apply thinkings like system thinking uh, to our thought processes to, to uncover our bias and to be able to recognize this bias. Obviously, we can't take bias out, but to be able to at least see this bias and use different models for us to see beyond that and to be able to look at possible futures and possible scenarios. So future thinking is really about knowing what we need to do today. And I see a question here from Joshua. Is this the same with scenario planning that some companies are already practicing? Very good. I think that's a very good example of an application of futures thinking. Shell, uh, which uh, Shell, the oil company, has used scenario planning. is actually one, one of the uh, pioneers when it comes to scenario planning. Or sometimes they call it Shell scenarios. Uh, use scenario planning and, and uh, to be able as an input to their strategic planning process. Okay? So they come, they come up with three to four different future scenarios, and that becomes an input to what will they do in the long term. Okay? They socialize that, they talk to their stakeholders about it, and they become better informed. They, have, they come up with better strategic choices for their organization. So that's a very good point, uh, Josh, and thank you for raising that. So yes, it, it is an input to uh, scenario planning and you use the scenarios and we teach you to actually how to develop these scenarios for yourselves in the course. Okay. If you want to read more about this, okay, the Asian Development Bank and, and most of my examples so far have been profit-oriented organizations, but definitely you can still use this even on a government uh, uh, perspective, you know, when it comes to policy development. And the Asian Development Bank came up with this uh, report that talks about futures thinking that gives specific examples in terms of how you can use futures thinking in different countries in Asia Pacific. And it's quite interesting and fun to read, actually, because it simplifies a lot of the seemingly 
complex concepts. So I'll show you later how you can get this. Normally you buy it, but uh, there's also a link that you can Google where you can actually download the report directly to yourself. So what, in the Philippines, where are we? So the Senate actually has created, uh, there's a special committee on sustainable development goals, uh, innovation and futures thinking. And that's led by Senator Pia Cayetano. And she's a big supporter of this. Um, funded one of the schools uh, somewhere in the north to look at the future of food and she's really a big supporter recently also um, you know Jed and the Department of Education have embarked on exploring futures thinking the Department of Education actually created a unit a future uh, thinking unit reporting to one of the undersecretaries so so this is a very exciting uh, space and many organizations actually um, some of our some of them have have been a client of mine I have started to use uh, futures thinking locally okay uh, another example that's really interesting is from DHL. I know this is small. It's really, my intention here is not to show the details. You can also download this report. Later on, I'll show you how and where you can get it. Um, just to say that this was, the name of this report is Delivering Tomorrow, Logistics Study, Logistics 2050, a scenario study. So again, this is a really good example of scenario planning or scenarios. Okay, and DHL uh, came up with five visions of the future. And what's interesting about this is this report came out uh, a few years, I think 2018. Okay. And they involved a lot of industry experts as well as futurists to help write this report. What is interesting is again, they came up with five visions of the future. One vision of the future, and I'd like you to pay close attention to this, describes a future when frequent catastrophes lead to a paradigm shift away from efficiency maximization to vulnerability mitigation and resilience. Sounds familiar, right? And if you look at, and the report actually discusses this in more detail, talks about disasters, talks about emergency logistics, supply disruption, the trend towards regional trade, resilience, decentralized solutions, redundant systems, supply security. Doesn't this sound familiar? Doesn't this world actually who are, describes the world that we're living in today, right? And the thing was, and again, as I mentioned, this report came out uh, two years ago, three, three years ago, okay, way before the pandemic. Uh, but then again, that's one value of the future. So if you're a logistics company or you're an organization that's dependent on logistics uh, for your operations or for the success of your, of your organization, then this is a very relevant report, right? And, and for some, they've actually planned uh, beforehand. Another example of how an organization uses futures thinking is Patagonia. Obviously, there's a bit of marketing here too. Uh, but their CEO, uh, Rose uh, Marcario, who uh, just very, I think late last year, she just retired. She grew Patagonia from a $250 million company to a $1 billion company in a span of, I think, 12 years. Okay. It's just pretty, pretty awesome. And she's known for really to be, to be a leader to, uh, who really thinks about the future. You know, and, and uses that to inform her organization's strategic choices. And she would ask her people, her senior managers, what's the biggest risk that our company faces in 30 years? Okay. And that's a really interesting question. And I also ask that question from you. What's the biggest risk that your company faces in 30 years? And for them, you know, one of the risks that they identified is this example that you see here, that they saw that in 25 years into the future, uh, the sources of virgin materials in supply chain. So for example, cotton, you know, it's going to be very challenging to source that. Uh, so there was really a need to, uh, to look at alternative ways that they could design their supply chain. So that's something interesting. Okay. Another report, which is interesting, and this one you can download also, uh, Deloitte last year came up with the Hotel of the Future. And they came up, I think, with 16 different 
views of how the hotels can potentially be. Uh, and that's quite interesting, especially in the light of the pandemic, especially how the tourism industry has been severely impacted. And, and it allows uh, hotels to actually think beyond the pandemic and think about what they will do when, it, when it's time to recover. Okay. So uh, here's what I want you to reflect, uh, for, reflect on. Why is, the future, why is futures thinking so important today? So you can write it on chat, okay? Or another one is I want you to go to this link, uh, HTTPS bit.ly, okay? I'm going to put the link in our chat, okay? Let me just go there directly. Uh, this will actually take you to my LinkedIn, okay? And on my LinkedIn, let me just share that very quickly, all right? Uh, you can write, you can connect to me. Uh, I'd really appreciate that. But then uh, you can also write your answer. So I hope you can see my screen. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I'll make it a bit bigger. So it goes to my question, which I posted a year ago. Why is futures thinking important today? So most of my classes, I ask them to answer people I've met. I ask them to answer this question. Okay. And you know, as a as something that you could take with you, uh, here's the link to the Asian Development Bank report on futures thinking, the one I showed you earlier. It's a link as well to DHL's report on del delivering tomorrow, which is a logistics 2050 scenario study, uh, which they published in 2018, if I'm not mistaken, as well as links to examples of scenario planning and how and the different future scenarios developed by Shell. Okay, uh, that's going that's used for its different stakeholders. So I think that's very interesting. Uh, please give your answers. Uh, you can connect to me. You can also uh, write on, you know, um, give, your, give your own feedback, your own perspective. There are no right or wrong answers here, but I do like to connect with you in case you have, you know, future questions. And I do post uh, the latest stuff when it comes to uh, futures thinking and strategic foresight uh, that you can use uh, for the future. So. So I think there's there, there's a lot that you can take there, okay? Right. So again, uh, futures thinking gives you a set of practical mind tools to think extraordinary, right? And uh, we got a lot of feedback from you know our past students in terms of how this actually broadened their perspectives. You know, it's very different from design thinking, although I would say they're like friends with benefits. Because design thinking is really looking at empathizing with the customer, uh, coming up, you know, really having a good view of the problem and framing the problem and then validating your solution based on that problem. Uh, and, then, uh, and, and then, yeah, basically taking that product or new service or process to market, you know, or really piloting it and then testing it, iterating and improving again. Uh, I said they're friends with benefits because futures thinking can actually go at the beginning part of the process when you're trying to identify what are the needs of the customers. And, it, and if you're looking at what are the future insights, or future uh, customer insights, you can use futures thinking there. You can also use futures thinking at that part where you're trying to validate your actual product, um, like what Tesla did. Uh, they came up with you know, the electric vehicle, and it was a way for them. And they validated that saying that, okay, I think we think this is really the product to go because obviously there's no future for combustion engine types of uh, vehicles. So, uh, so yeah. So going back uh, to this, you know, I'd like just to share with you like some of the work that my students did. So, uh, as mentioned earlier by Seth, we offer uh, futures thinking as a standalone course as part of the School of Executive Education, uh, but we also offer it as part of the Master of Science in Innovation and Business program last year. Uh, we we're the first higher education institution to be able to do this, and I'm proud because I was the one who designed the course. And, one, and my students, 60 of them, actually came up with 60 different studies of the future. Uh, it's quite small here, and, uh, but I'll show you some examples. So one of my students looked at 
uh, how precision future will become the future of Filipino smallholder farmers, how Philippine corporations innovate in the next decade, uh, the future of non-standard work in the Philippines, what will happen to Philippine hospitals post-COVID. So this is something that, you know, when you take up the course, you will have to do a full-blown report that, that they did because they really did a lot of research, a lot of writing here, uh, you know, because obviously it's part of an academic program. But we will do the same explorations. We will use the same tools in the School of Education, Executive Education. Uh, and it's up to you if you really want to, you know, write a full paper about it. But normally we just create a simple PowerPoint presentation. The important thing is for you to be able to get your insights that you can use for your work to make your work better, to make you a better strategic leader, to make you someone who really thinks about the future in a systematic way. Okay. And just to share with you, they've actually come up with a series of webinars. So that's available in the AIM MSID Facebook page. You can search for that. One of my students, I'm really proud of her. She was even invited by NEDA uh, Region, the one in Ililo, Region 6. Uh, to present, you know, the, Philipp the future of uh, Philippine local innovation ecosystems, and she used Iloilo as a, you know, as a case. Um, so that's really, really uh, interesting. So you can think about what are the topics that you're really interested in, um, and we could use that. And that's normally what we do in our course. It's something that's very applied. It's applied to your context. It's applied to your needs. Um, so you think of a product or a service or a market, an industry, a topic that you're really interested in. And we use the tools in class to be able and apply that uh, for you to, be able to, to explore the future of that particular topic. So it's really applied and really interesting. And what framework do we use? So we talk about the generic foresight process framework. And this is basically the backbone of the whole course where we look at the inputs, information sources, we look at the actual foresight process where we analyze these inputs, we interpret them, we prospect, prospecting means we look at images of the future, ideas of the future, and then this become an output, which is a report. Okay? So we go all the way up to output. Um, as mentioned, futures thinking is not about strategy development. It's different. It's a different. That's a totally different course. I think AIM also offers that course if you're interested, uh, but that's different. Okay? But that feeds into that uh, strategy or I would say policy or even innovation process. Okay? So just to give you a taste of, you know, what do we mean by inputs? Okay? Uh, normally, when we look and see what's happening, as you can see on the right side here, you know, each step actually answers a certain question. Uh, when we go and look and see what's happening, we talk about environmental scanning. But environmental scanning here is a little bit different from the environmental scanning that we know. Maybe some of you have already developed strategies. That's fine. Normally, we look at external opportunities and threats, right? But what makes this different is we look at external opportunities and threats, not only of the present, but also of the future. And we do that by being able to see the ripples before the tsunami comes. And for me, a perfect depiction of that is this uh, Japanese uh, painting that was made in the 16th century. It's one of my favorite paintings. And you can see here in the foreground, you have that huge wave. At the background, you have Mount Fuji. And if you look very closely, you see these boats and you see these people on these boats actually riding the wave. And for me, this is what futures thinking helps you. you know? Futures thinking enables you to see the ripples that occur in the horizon, also known as signals. Okay? Because these ripples become waves, and these waves become storms or tsunamis. Successful organizations and individuals are always scanning the horizon for signals of change. And that's what we teach you in the course. We teach you to look for these signals. Okay? And what is a signal? So we got this from the Institute for the Future. By the way, if you're interested to, to you know, they, they, you can go to their website. They actually have a lot of resources that you can look at. They share a lot of their studies of the future. Um, and it's quite interesting. And they're saying that a signal is an example of the future found in the present. Okay. So what's an example of that? A good example of that is this startup. Maybe you've heard of this already before. I started to monitor the startup, I think, late 
late 2019 or early 2020. So it's called Neuro, and I think now it's becoming more commonplace. A lot more people know about it. It's called Neuralink. It's not, it's a brain machine interface platform. It's not the only company that does it, but it's more popular to the others because obviously Elon Musk is involved. Again, Elon Musk, he's involved with a lot of future, a lot of future oriented uh, companies. Okay. But Neuralink, what does it do? Okay. It helps to understand and treat brain disorders. Uh, preserve and enhance your own brain. Basically, it has a small chip. Before, it used to be wires, but now they've come up with a new design where it's just a small chip that's implanted in your brain and you're able to basically get impulses uh, and understand and sense the world without using your senses. So, for example, if you're deaf, uh, they connect you know, the neural link to, let's say, a sensor um, in your ear, and then that sensor feeds directly into the chip, and the chip sends impulses directly into your brain, and it's, and it's as if you're already hearing, okay? but you don't need any of your, you know, your, your ear, your eardrums, whatever. Okay? And, and they're thinking of really using this, the immediate application for this would be the medical field. You know, in terms of those people who have, uh, let's say, brain uh, disorders or uh, nerve damage and so on. But you can look at this and we, what we do in the course is we actually analyze this. We analyze this in terms of, you know, what does this change mean? And it can, change, and it can mean many things depending on your context, depending on your industry, right? So if you're in advertising, for example, what does this mean? If people can directly upload information into their brain? What does this mean if you're in the education industry? What does this mean if you're in, you know, if you're a doctor, you know? Uh, and then we look at, okay, what's the driver of this change? What's the human values driving this change? Because by knowing that, we'd be able to extrapolate because most, in most cases, the motivations for this particular signal or this particular change may or may not continue moving forward. We look at the probability. We look at the impact of this happening, and we look at what what will the world look like, you know. Or at the very least, if you limit the scope to your context, you know, your work, your organization, your company, your industry, how will your industry look like if this particular technology becomes commonplace and widespread? Okay? And in the course, we not only look at technology, we look at other factors too that may change, that may drive change. We look at social factors, we look at regulatory factors, we look at political factors. You know, next year we have uh, the elections again, and that will have, a, I would say, a very substantial impact, or maybe no impact, but I would say it will really set the course for the next six years of uh, the future of our country, and therefore, let's say, our industry, our economy, and so on. All right, so we talk about signals a lot, but then we talk a lot about, you know, other tools that we can use to think about the future in a systematic way. Okay, but because the future is already here, it's not just even distributed. I don't know if you agree or disagree with that. You can put it on the chat if you agree. Future is already here. It's happening in another country. It's happening in another organization. And it's just a matter of time, but sometimes we don't know, right, whether it will really happen to us. But it's good to have that study because what, what's one of the biggest paradoxes, the biggest paradox of our time, or one of them, is that for us to really have a good idea of the future, we have to have a really good understanding of the present. And that's sort of where we buckle. Why? Because there's so much data, there's so much information that's out there, and there's so many things that are changing. Okay, and sometimes we get flooded. Okay, sometimes we get lost. You know, we keep we we lose track of the of of the change that's happening. So what this course actually helps you to do is to be able to organize this information, find out what's relevant, find out what's not, and looking at that relevant information, be able to come up with scenarios for the future. Okay? So futures thinking enables you to think beyond the now with the gift of the empowered future. And what are really good examples of this? I already gave some, I actually already gave a lot, 
considering that this is just an intro course. No? And you're going to get a lot more when you take the full-blown course. Uh, one of my teachers, uh, he actually helped to organize this, where they talked about the future of world of plastic pollution in the ocean. And what they did, what they did, instead of posting like you know boring infographics or you know charts and numbers, they actually made it more interactive, where they showed the how much plastic pollution there would be in the years 1910, 1960, 2010, 2030, using actual water coolers. And people had to drink from these water coolers, which is kind of gross, but also very compelling at the same time. You can see in the picture the amount of plastic pollution in the year 2030. And that's a very good example of how you can use futures thinking for an advocacy, you know, to, to make a change, for people to realize that, hey, the future is already here, right? Maybe it hasn't struck us yet, but it's already here. Another one, it's not only for profit, but it's really helping individuals. So one of my favorite examples is this. It's called the Vision Not Victim Project. And you can Google that, www.visionnotvictim.org, where they use futures thinking to actually help girls in refugee camps to think beyond the present, to give them hope that they can be who they want to be. And they actually dress them up. They have workshops that really help these girls to, to go beyond, and we know how bad refugee camps can be. I myself, you know, I I've, have not experienced it, but my friends who actually have visited refugee camps, they say it's, it's, it's a really, really tough. Uh, and I love this project a lot. Uh, another one is obviously SpaceX. Uh, what's interesting here is obviously, I think just a few weeks ago, was it last month? where you had both Virgin and uh, Amazon sending their first commercial space, uh, space flights, you know, sending it out, launching it. Um, and they're kidding uh, Elon Musk that, hey, Elon Musk, you're late. Okay? And SpaceX is another Elon Musk uh, startup. But what I like about this is, is, is this quote about how, uh, how important it is uh, for us to think about the future, to be to enable the survival of the human race, because that's what some of the futurists are saying, that if we're really thinking about the future survival of the human race, we have to be a space-faring civilization. And, and, and that's really quite, quite interesting to me. And the bigger picture here is for us to really have a vision for ourselves. Uh, being able to launch the first man in the moon. This was in the early 1960s. And when John F. Kennedy actually said that we are going to launch, we are going to be the first nation that's going to, to uh, bring a man to the moon. They didn't know how, but in that process of setting that vision, they were able to galvanize a whole industry, create new industries, create new technologies that even up to now, you know, we sort of take it for granted, but that was because of that particular vision. So I'd like to end with this, and it's my favorite quote, this present moment used to be the unimaginable future. So look at where you are right now. You're looking at your screens, or maybe you're somewhere you're listening to your phone. Um, and even you yourself, you know, at one point in time, all of this was just the figment of one's imagination. You yourself were the figment of your parents' imagination. So a lot of this, th these marvels, and many of them we take for granted, was once just a preposterous idea. And think more now, give, knowing that, knowing that we can create these laws, the government, etc. Many of the, the five-day work week, at one point in time, this did not exist. And many of these problems too did not exist before. So looking into the future, thinking of long-term, thinking of what we can do moving forward, think of what we, you know, think of the possible things that we can actually accomplish. So I'd like to thank you uh, for giving me the time. Okay, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, follow me on LinkedIn, I already gave the link earlier. And you can also email me in case you have uh, questions. Uh, futures thinking is an advocacy of mine, and for me, I really believe that if we want to change our future, we have to change our discussions of the future, and we need to have those conversations now. 
So thank you very much. And uh, I think we have time for uh, so, some Q&A, right, Steph? Mm -hmm. So thank you very much, uh, Prof, for that very eye-opening discussion. So let me just uh, share again uh, the reminders for this program with the question and answers. Okay, so once again, the Futures Thinking program is scheduled on September 3, 8, 10, 15, and 17, Wednesdays and Fridays from 1.30 p.m. until 5 p.m. The program or the classes will be delivered online via live virtual interactive Zoom sessions. It's currently priced at 25,000 pesos or 500 US dollars. This, uh, it already includes the learning materials, Zoom licenses, and certificate of completion and others. In attending this afternoon's uh, info session, you will be eligible for a 10% discount upon your enrollment, only available until August 27, 5 p.m. Uh, payments can be done through credit card, fan transfer, bank transfer through uh, PayMaya, GCash, or check payment over the counter. And also to give you an idea, we offer installment um, scheme to ease uh, settling payment fees. You may scan the QR code as uh, flash in the screen or submit a fully accomplished enrollment form at go.aim.edu slash seal enrollment. If you have questions regarding the uh, program details or the enrollment procedures, you may contact me through mobile and email as flash. Okay, so Next, we'll go on to the question and answer uh, portion. So you may upload them by the q and tab so that we can see them and uh, Professor will be able to answer them for everyone's benefit. Okay, so uh, Prof, here uh, we have the uh, first question. Uh, so what is the right. format of the course? Uh, what will be the tackling case studies on the Philippines or just case studies from overseas? And um, what is your uh, latest journal publication with regards to that? Okay. So first of all, uh, the format of the course is fairly interactive. Obviously it's online. So uh, ideally you would actually want to deliver this in person, but it's online and it's mainly, I would say, uh, 60-40, 40% would be theoretical, 60% would be practical. So mo in most cases, it's adult learning in terms of style. So it's really based on what your needs are and what's important to you. Uh, in terms of case studies, I will give a lot of case studies, but unfortunately here in the Philippines, it's something that's just started. So I can't really give any case studies locally. I will give examples, but not as a formal case study in terms of the Philippines. But I will give a lot of case studies uh, abroad in terms of what's done. Uh, I think in terms of the format during the Friday sessions, it's pretty much the same. It's all, um, uh, I would say, lectures. Uh, I You would have to do some work outside of the classroom in terms of researching on signals and researching on your particular topic, obviously. Um, that's one of the things that you would be that you would need to prepare for and you can go as deep and as broad as you want. I won't stop you. Um, I don't have any journal publications, at least not related to this because uh, I'm a practicing futurist. So most of the most of my time is actually spent working with clients in terms of helping them develop the research, training them. So, uh, you know, that's one of my objectives, um, uh, but none, not yet. Um, there's one question. Is there a required output for the course? Yes, which is, well, not really required. It's up to you if you want to do it, but I would say it's a loss because we won't give you a grade, obviously. Um, uh, but it would be a loss if you won't be able to do it. So we're going to ask you to uh, investigate a topic of your choice. So it could be, let's say, the future of, let's say, the Internet of Things or the future of Agritech or the future of uh, 
NFTs or blockchain, and you investigate it using the different tools that we have. So, so that's the required output. Because I really want you to find something that's relevant to you. Um, so and and use the different tools and we'll give you you know part of the course is during class I'll give you feedback I'll give you co coaching in terms of how you can uh, approach your futures exploration and hopefully that's something that's aligned to your work it's something that's useful let's say to your organization and to your own self okay so that's the required output required but it's not in an academic sense that you need to do it otherwise you fail i think for this course as long as you attend all of the you know most of the the training uh sessions you're okay <laughs> yeah so you know there's not much pressure there but obviously if you want to make the most out of it then you have to then you have to apply it okay any other questions so for maybe other the en chat. enrollment uh, questions, um, we can discuss further with regards to the payment options. You may email me through the uh, details of, uh, I presented earlier. And for these sessions, this is a five half day program. So each half day, uh, it will be a three and 30 minute hour long uh, session. Okay, so um, are there any last minute questions? Um, for Prof. Jose. Okay, so, so far, um, there are no other outstanding questions. So if you have further questions with him, you may contact him through the um, social media details he presented earlier, such as LinkedIn. So with that... Um, or, or email, I think there is a question, mm -hmm. how many... Thank you okay. to Josh Rel. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, Kara is asking how many students are there usually in the course? Okay, so with regards to the number of students, um, we are aiming for at least 15 to 20 students uh, per run of this program. Okay. Normally, it's not a lot. Normally, mm -hmm. it's not a lot, which is good because it actually, I mean, in terms of teacher to student ratio, uh, it's actually good. Uh, I really get to spend time to to know you, and know you know, and we 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 have more time to actually answer questions during class. Okay, so I guess we don't have any questions. If you have further questions, uh, feel free to uh, personally message us or professor. Okay. Okay. So you. when, thank when you is it very going much. to be? It's in September, right? So, uh, yes, it's September two weeks 30. from now. Yeah. Okay, so thank Perfect. you everyone. So I hope, I, uh, I hope mm -hmm. to see everyone there. <laughs> okay, yeah. so for more information about our latest programs, you may visit our website at go.aim.edu slash seal or you may email us at seal at aim.edu. For updates, you may subscribe to our mailing list at go.aim.edu slash seal mailing list. So thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Prof. Jose, for this um, very insightful discussion. So thank you, everyone, and great have pleasure. a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Thank you.